Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Hashem and uh, you're here for another Pushing Film live stream. Today we're going to be doing a stream of myself converting a few digitized negatives in, neg um, in Negative Lab Pro and Lightroom as a follow-up to a video I did on the channel recently. You can um, check it out if you haven't seen it. It was a video called Batch Scanning Film with a Digital Camera. And this is a live stream I mentioned I would do as a follow-up to that, just to sort of uh, show a little bit more of the slowed down process of Negative Lab Pro. And I'm just gonna quickly show you here um, just what I'm talking about is uh, what you have in Lightroom after having digitized a bunch of film frames, whether it's 35 mil, 120 or whatever, and just showing you the actual process I use in a little bit more detail and uh, you know, covering that conversion process and just some little tips that I've uh, learned along the way. So how's it going? Thanks for joining today if you're here live. Uh, if you're not here live, I've jumped on a little bit um, early or have I? No, I'm on time. So you know, feel free to skip ahead to maybe a couple of minutes or a few minutes into the, the video if you're not here live because I'm just gonna wait for a, a few people to hop on and hey, I've got Matt. Hey man, how's it going? Yes, I'm doing a live stream today. It's uh, 11 a.m. here in Melbourne. It's uh, the first day out of lockdown 5.0 for us, which is great. And um, yeah, so <laughs> Matt in the comments, love it. And let me know what you guys think of this um, new mic setup. I've got a lot of noise outside um, in this um, window that you can't really see here, a lot of cars driving past. So I've switched to a dynamic mic because it picks up less sound, less noise. And hopefully that's a little bit let, um, little bit better in terms of audio quality for things like these live streams. So I've got Hector in the live chat. Hi from Colombia. Hey Hector, thanks for joining. And yeah, if anyone here has any questions and answers, that's also what I wanted to cover is any uh, Q and A you have about DSLR scanning using Negative Lab Pro. I've got nothing to do with um, Negative Lab Pro. I'm not even affiliated, and I know that maybe Nate, the maker of the program, might disagree with a lot of my uh, methodology, but this is again, just my way of using the app. So yeah, just keep that in mind. And someone else in the chat, I'm just about to scan in some old Kodachrome slides. Awesome. That's really cool. Grant, Michael, Mike sounds great. Yeah, thanks. All right. So I've got a couple of um, questions through the Instagram story. I announced this live stream on the Instagram page on Pushing Film, and I just uh, had a couple of questions there straight off the get-go. And I think there's some really good questions to start with. And one thing that I got asked was about um, what sort of uh, exposure settings I use for the actual digital image. And do I use aperture priority or another trick? So generally I use manual uh, exposure on my digital camera, which is a 5D Mark IV, when I'm doing the actual digitization. And if you want to check it out, I actually have a page I wrote up. This was linked in the uh, the video. So this is the video in question. There's a link to this article in the description of the video watching right now with this whole page, this sort of tips of all the different little things I use in terms of equipment and the written tips for um, scanning in terms of, you know, emulsion side up, the holder I use, the lighting alignment using this mirror trick here, um, stabilization, the settings I use. So you can, if you want to go in depth, check this out. This will be kind of something I wrote up just to help you out if you're getting into this, how to expose, you know, you can see there on that histogram and uh, little tips and tricks. But yeah, that's there if you want it and a bunch of links to other resources I've done, including things on Essential Film Holder and videos here on YouTube and whatnot. So going back to Lightroom, on that question of exposure, um, what you want to do is try and expose evenly throughout the whole roll of film. If you're batch scanning, you want that exposure to be fairly even. Even if you have a dark shot on the negative or a light shot on the negative, you shouldn't vary your digital camera exposure too much. And just to show you what I mean by that, if we look at this frame here, this is a fairly bright scene. So on the negative, it's got a lot of dark information. See that sky uh, information there? That's sky, that's bright. But when you compare that to a scene like this one, which was a fairly you know more evenly exposed scene in comparison, my digital camera, if I had it on aperture priority, would probably want to vary the exposure between these two frames. But it's important that you probably don't vary that unless you really need to. If you have something severely underexposed on the negative, you can take the exposure and change it a little bit to try and rescue that information. But the exposure settings should be pretty similar because what you want is for that film base to be fairly evenly exposed throughout the whole roll of film when you're batch scanning because 
this darkness in the negative will throw the camera's meter off and you want that to come out as bright sky because that's what it is. There's a lot of white you know, information on the sail here, which you'll see later. And uh, this one had a lot of dark shadow because I was exposing to let those shadows go dark. So try and keep that exposure consistent throughout the roll. Uh, have it around the middle of your matrix or evaluative meter reading, maybe a little bit higher. It's better to go a little bit brighter on the digital camera because when you convert it, that's gonna give you better um, information in the conversion. All right. So just going back to the live chat. Goran from Ottawa, Canada. Hey, thanks for joining. And uh, Matt telling me I sound a bit nasally. I think I actually sound a bit nasally today in general. I don't know what it is. No, I think it's this microphone. These um, dynamic mics have more of that kind of um, radio sound. And it could be your phone speakers as well. And Deborah from Argentina. Hey, thanks for joining. All right, so if you're uh, in Lightroom, let's say you've scanned an entire roll of film, these are photos from two different rolls of film that you're seeing here. The green ones are from a roll of Portrait 800 and the blue marked ones are from a roll of Fuji Pro 400H. I'm not going to go through an entire 36 shot roll in terms of converting, uh, converting the negatives because it takes too long. There's that processor side of things in terms of conversion that would take a while. But let's say you have a whole roll and you've selected 36 shots. Um, let's just do four for argument's sake and just play with these ones here. So the first thing you want to do is just find a frame that has a little bit of uh, the, the film base showing in it and go into your develop module and you want to white balance off that film base, right? So if you've got the border there, that works well. If you don't have the border, sometimes just finding an extremely dark part of the scene, which on the negative would show up as a light part of the scene. So the whitest part of the image could be just here, for example. That will give you a pretty good white balance to work with. It'll be almost the same. So if I go here, click there, barely made any difference. So if you haven't scanned with the borders, you can just do that. You wanna find a piece of the film base to white balance off. Once you've done that, you can leave the borders or you can go ahead and crop them. Let's say you've left them and you want them to show up in your final scan. You don't do anything in terms of cropping there. At this point, you're gonna open Negative Lab Pro. I'm using the um, keyboard shortcut for that. And because I've left a lot of the border there, I want to make sure I leave some border buffer in this little option here. Uh, I've got Kim saying g'day from Melbourne. Hey, thanks for joining. Uh, but yeah, this is a bit of a guesstimation. And I hope that maybe in a future version of Negative Lab Pro, there'll be a way to have an overlay to see where that border buffer would lie. But that could be a little bit tricky. So you have to kind of assume, all right, this is maybe 5 to 10% of the, um, the frame. So I'm just gonna put in 10% for safety, meaning that Negative Lab Pro will only account for the inside 90% of this frame. It'll ignore the 10% border on the outside. So I'm gonna choose that for, um, for making this conversion. Before I do that, I'm just gonna cancel and go back and show you what I would do in terms of a batch conversion. Let's say I had all these four uh, you know, frames from the scene. I would just sync them so they all have that same white balance. I'm gonna make sure I have white balance ticked there. If I've also cropped them, you can you know, sync your crop. Sorry, I synced off the first one there, but let's just go and do that white balance again, just to show you how it's done and then sync across. And now they've all got that same white balance. So now you can be in any view you like. You can maybe go into survey view or whatever you like if, if you're doing the conversion, open negative lab pro. And assuming they've all got that 10% border buffer, uh, go ahead and just convert those negatives after you've chosen your options here. So the default color model is Frontier, which I, I like. I don't find a huge difference between Frontier and Noritsu. Obviously, if you're doing black and white, you'll be choosing black and white. And pre-saturation, I like to set to medium or default. I don't know if there's a huge difference between the two, but I'll just um, leave that and convert four negatives. So in your case, if you're doing a whole roll, this would be 36 negatives. And now this is the part that takes a little bit of extra time. Uh, so, you know, if I was doing the whole roll, this could take, you know, five, 10 minutes, depending on your processor speed on your computer. And I've got Asher a little late. What is he using to scan the negatives? So Asher, just check the uh, link in the description of the video. I've got a, a whole article there showing the equipment I use and so on. And it is a digital camera, it's a 5D Mark IV. So there you go, all right, we've got the conversion and you can see these are all default settings and it already looks pretty good. This is a roll of Portrait 800 and you can see nothing's changed here. Uh, you've got soft highs and lows turned on. You won't really see this unless you're kind of 
so on your own screen zooming in but when you click soft highs you can look at that van in the background i'm not sure if you can detect it it just softens those highlights a little bit same with the shadows i like to use the soft highs but i like hard shadows so i just leave that unticked and this is where you have those options and um going to the next question i had on instagram uh, one person asked me, it was w.johns, do you use the presets on NLP for different film stocks? For example, the Kodak preset? And the answer is sometimes I do. All right. So the first thing you want to do after you've set, uh, you know, your, your tones profile. So just showing you, you've got like soft and it's only affecting that first one, as you can see there. And you can go to something like cinematic log, which would be really flat. Lab will try and replicate a lab scanner, which tends to add a lot of contrast. You got lab hard there, which to me is way too harsh and lab soft, which is a happy medium, which gives you some uh, room to edit later. So I generally like the lab standard. That's the default setting. I think it does a pretty good job. And then sometimes I'll modify based on that. So you can see as I slide things like contrast, it's affecting that first negative only. And you might want to bring down things like highlights. You can do whatever you want. I'm not going to really sit here and edit these too much, but one thing people struggle with is the color balance. So you can see here Kodak is the default selection. Maybe it's the last thing I used, uh, but you've also got auto neutral, which tends to do a pretty good job as well. That's usually the default setting. And let's change to auto cool. You can see that's made it really cool. And to be honest, most of these settings work quite well. Sometimes you'll have some film that doesn't respond too well and you can do the white balance manually by dragging this little gray um, square here out onto some kind of white or gray information in the scene which is great if you've actually shot a uh, gray card, for example, at the beginning of your role for a studio session. That's a really good uh, feature of this software. But we're gonna go with auto neutral, looks pretty good, for example. And let's say I press um, sync settings. That's going to sync the NLP settings across to all of those four frames, or in your case, it could be the whole role. So if you go back and watch my other video, you might have uh, scenes within your roll of film taken across different environments that have different lighting. And that's where you can actually go in and change individual scenes by themselves. Uh, you've also got this sync scene feature, which uh, if you read the little um, pop-up bubble, it syncs in a different way. So basically what it's saying here is that only the master photo needs to be converted. So you can only convert one photo. And if you know they're all from the same scene, you can actually use sync scene and it'll actually be quicker than using the NLP conversion for each of the four um, frames. But you can mess around with that. Definitely check out Nate's wealth of information on the NLP forums and on the NLP website. But again, just showing you how I usually do this, but let's look at Kodak, which looks a little bit cooler. I actually prefer that. And then um, another option you have down here is to use different uh, color profiles in Lightroom. This is another great new feature. So if you look at natural, it changes the hue of the blues and the reds a little bit to make them look a little bit more natural. Whereas uh, the Frontier, for example, adds a very different kind of uh, hue to the blues and greens. It has a bit of a greenish blue shift to some of the colors, almost that lemon orange sort of you know yellow sometimes, depending on the skin tones. Uh, but you've also got some other options there like the crystal, which is based on crystal archive paper, which is really punchy. And you know, it's a nice look if you like that, maybe not so much for this scene, it's already got a lot of contrast and pack on, which tries to emulate a pack on scanner. So you can play with, around with that, see what you like. I generally go with natural or maybe frontier, sync those settings across again. You can see it's um, sync them across and then you can make a copy, which I always recommend doing uh, because then it'll make a JPEG or TIFF copy of those images and uh, stack them or add them to a subfolder if you like. So I've just got someone in live chat. After watching a video on Ektachrome, realize that at least 90% of the reason I shoot is the projection aspect. A lot of my work is at night, which is uh, truly an amazing video. Yeah, Ektachrome at night is great and projecting it on a you know slide projector is amazing. It's the best way to see slide film in my opinion. Cool, so I hope that gives you an idea. If anyone has questions, uh, you know, on this part of the process, let me know. Just gonna add that subfolder, click apply. And then what you'll probably notice is that these images are flipped horizontally, they're mirrored. So you look at the writing there, that's because my recommendation is to scan on the emulsion side. And the easy uh, solution to that is while they're all selected, you just go to photo and you go flip horizontal. And one thing about that, you notice I only flipped this one. So let's undo that. 
So you need to be in library view, I think in the, the grid view for it to actually work when you're doing multiple. So if I select multiple now and go to photo uh, flip horizontal, it will flip all of them. And now going to that one, you can see that it is the right way around. And um, you know, that's that. Now the cool thing is if you have individual scenes or frames that you wanna work on a little bit more in NLP rather than starting to work on them in Lightroom, you can just select those individual frames or whatever it is, uh, open Negative Lab Pro again, and all those settings will have retained. And you can just work on that one individual scene, apply it, make a new copy, or then whatever you like. There's a lot of versatility here. All right, so let's go back and just uh, look at another few frames from a different film just to show a different look altogether this is fuji pro 400 h so we'll select from across a few different scenes just to see how much variation we get across so first things first i'm going to go to the develop module to white balance i'm going to use the base here since i've got a bit of the border but like i said if you were to find a bit of uh, white or clear part of the film like this that would give you a similar white balance and would work just as well. All right, so now I'm gonna select all the frames for that I wanna convert, sync that white balance setting across, which it's done, change views. Um, at this point, you can flip the photos horizontally here if you want. I'm not sure if it works in survey view, let's see. See, so, you know, it only does the first one. So for whatever reason, uh, Lightroom is weird like that, so it only seems to do multiples in library. And I wish they would change that. So now that's flipped the rest of them. Now we can go back to all those. Open Negative Lab Pro. And you've got 5% border here. I think it might be retaining some settings from the last conversion I did. Uh, but let's just leave that on 5, maybe change it to 8% just in case. And convert those. So is anyone here from Melbourne? Because uh, it's our first day of freedom today after lockdown 5.0, we're going into what they're calling a lockdown light. And if you are uh, in Melbourne coming out of lockdown, do you have plans to go and shoot? And what are you gonna shoot? Because I know I've been sort of itching to get back out and a lot of film has been sitting in my cameras waiting to be shot. All right, so that conversion was just done. And there we go, I've gone back to Lightroom. You can see what it's done here. And now that's lab standard. The white balance selected is the Fuji mode. If I go to auto neutral, not a huge difference. Auto cool, that's obviously pretty cool. Um, but yeah, auto neutral generally does a good job. What well, my advice is that start with auto neutral. If that doesn't work, then choose the actual film emulsion brand. So if you're using Fuji, go with Fuji or Kodak and uh, you know, so on. And maybe you can experiment and try other options altogether, uh, like some of these auto modes, Cine, if you're using Cine film, obviously like 250D or 500T, those work really well. But generally speaking, auto neutral does a pretty great job. Um, then you can also manually change a little bit. So if it looks a little bit too magenta, you can maybe slide that back a little bit and manually uh, have a custom white balance if you like. So looking at that across all these scenes, it works pretty well for most of these frames, but some of these are a lot flatter. So let's go back, maybe choose Fuji and the natural LUT, sync those settings across. And you can see I actually brought down brightness and contrast. It's retaining those settings from the last time I converted. Asha saying, congratulations on freedom. Looking forward to all the shots. Thanks mate. Jamie Manners from Perth, lockdown free. Yep, you guys have it good there. Hope you're all doing okay over in the Far East. Thanks, yeah, I really feel for Sydney to be honest. I think they have it a lot worse in terms of their situation. Alex Nguyen in develop, you can select multiple photos, select auto sync and perform an action to all selected. Yeah, actually, I think there is a way to do it. You're right. So you can go up to here in the quick develop and use auto. But yeah, I'm, there's probably a way that I'm not aware of, of actually um, doing the horizontal flip. So you're saying select auto sync and perform an action to all selected. Okay, yeah, that's a good tip. I'm gonna try that next time. Uh, all right, so 
we've synced those NLP settings across. And this time I'm not gonna make a copy, I'm just gonna apply them. Because let's say you're pretty happy with the way the whole role looks, except for a couple of scenes or a couple of shots individually. And uh, you can just apply. And let's say you wanna go in and work on particular shots. I might choose this one, for example, um, go into a, a singular view of that, reopen NLP and say, all right, this is a bit too contrasty or whatever it is. And I can bring down the contrast for that, right? And then I can maybe change white balance if I want. I can say it's too warm, whatever you like. You can even use a separate LUT for this one, um, which you can change uh, after the fact anyway. Actually, no, you can't if you've changed it to a JPEG or TIFF, uh, but you can apply another LUT on top of the first one. So you can apply that. And maybe now you have a better conversion of that particular frame. And maybe you have a scene down here, which is looking really flat, like maybe these two images. Oop, sorry, cancel that. So I'm gonna deselect everything and maybe just select the car and the house shot here, open them together in survey view, open NLP for just these two shots. And then I might wanna add contrast to these ones because the negative two setting might not have worked well for particular shots in your role. So I would maybe increase that till I'm happy with it. Maybe warm it up a little bit, even use a different white balance profile. See, auto neutral doesn't look very good here. In this case, I would go back to the Fuji one. Looks pretty good. Maybe I'd add a bit of warmth to that. Bring the brightness back up. Darks down. So I'm just gonna introduce more contrast and then I'm gonna sync those settings across. So it works pretty well. And then uh, apply that. And then if you want, you can go back to your entire role. And then once you've selected everything, once it looks good here, these are still raw digital images from the camera. I'm gonna open NLP and then do my make a copy. So at this point, I would choose JPEG, create a subfolder, apply that. And you'll see up in the top there, there's a little loading bar saying it's processing, which is changing and making a um, JPEG copy of all those images which I would then go ahead and work on separately in the Lightroom module as I normally would with um, scans I got from a lab, for example. And you can see it's populating a folder down here. I'm pretty sure it's this one. And it usually names it positives. So it just adds them all to a new folder. And then you can work on them in positive format, meaning nothing is flipped around when you change sliders in Lightroom. For example, you don't have to work in reverse. And I think that's a lot better than working with the sliders reversed. Okay. So this is the positives folder from the last one. As you can see now they're JPEGs and uh, it retains a lot of the metadata. But if I go into develop module, everything works as normal. And this is where you can do further adjustments and remove any dust you might have. But as you can see, you get a pretty good result from um, this DSLR scanning method with Negative Lab Pro, the colors are great. You can go ahead and apply further profiles if you want, including the, the free NLP ones. Like you might want a little bit of that crystal archive paper profile, a little bit of the pack on look on top of what you've already done. Uh, you can apply the Frontier one if you didn't in the first place. And the great thing about the Lightroom profiles is you can apply them gradually. So you can only have like maybe 50% of the Frontier profile. Once you're happy with the colors, you know, you would probably remove a bit of dust, which I picked up a bit of here. And maybe uh, applying any further sharpening if you like. So this is already pretty sharp, but you could either do sharpening here or in Lightroom. If it's an image I'm about to print, I'll usually do my sharpening in Lightroom. If it's just for online, um, the Lightroom, sorry, I'll do my, for print, I'll do my sharpening in Photoshop. Uh, for online, I'll use Lightroom. It's usually good enough. And you can see there like maybe in the range of 25 to 40% usually gives you a very sharp image and uh, plenty of detail in the grain. The grain looks really good. So yeah, that's it guys. That's my methodology. And uh, someone is asking why I choose JPEG instead of TIFF. Sometimes I choose TIFF if I think I'm going to print them. In my experience, uh, there's not a huge difference except for in file size. If you're gonna do some heavy editing, then TIFF is obviously better. You get a little bit more leeway to bring up shadows and all that. But I try and do as much of that as I can in NLP first with the actual raw file. And then once you have a high quality JPEG, to be honest, you can print from a JPEG and it'll be just as good as a print from a TIFF. You won't tell the difference. But I find maybe if you're doing some heavy editing, a TIFF will give you a little bit more leeway. 
But in terms of the JPEG, if it's at 100% quality, it's not awfully compressed. So it's usually gonna save you a lot of hard drive space. That's my main reasoning. My hard drives get very full with all the client work and weddings and videos and stuff and these YouTube videos. So I purely do it for, you know, reasons of file uh, space on my hard drives. But yeah, it's definitely good to use TIFF if you don't um, have an issue with hard drive space, for example. And uh, yeah, another tip I'll probably give is that if you're not getting this level of quality in the actual digital images you're taking on your DSLR or mirrorless camera, a lot of it is down to the lens. I get a lot of questions on Instagram about uh, you know, issues with digitization and getting blotches and weird light reflections and whatnot. I think the lens is really important and the light source. So using a good light source and using a good macro lens, you can get away with using extension tubes and uh, things like that. But I generally find that they're more prone to introducing issues uh, compared to a good macro lens. And uh, Matt in the chat, who is Chigaiva, Let's go shooting for sure, man. Now that we're free, let's see how long it lasts. We definitely have to get out and shoot some street. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's what I wanted to run you through. Uh, and I don't want to go on too much longer. I think this gives you a good idea. Uh, definitely go back and watch that other video I put out on the channel. This was just meant to be a follow-up to answer any questions. So if anyone does have any more questions, feel free to drop them now before I end the stream soon. We've been live for about 26 minutes. So that's usually a good amount of time. And uh, yeah, check out that article as well. So if you didn't catch that earlier on, there's an article linked, uh, linked in the description of the video with uh, all my tips, all my methodology, all the equipment I use and sort of a breakdown of all those little uh, bits and pieces. I didn't really cover the Negative Lab Pro aspect of uh, the conversion process in here because there is so much down to your personal taste, but that's why I did this video. So this video, there's a little bit covered in the previous one uh, and uh, and it's all really about practice. Just trial and error, develop your own workflow, see what works well for you because what works for me might not work for you. You might shoot a lot of a particular film like completely different to these two, which always gives you difficult results, but make sure you're getting a good image in your digital camera first. Nice, even exposures across all the frames. Use a good lens, make sure everything's aligned. You turn off other light sources when you're digitizing, follow all those tips in the guide and uh, experiment with Negative Lab Pro. Develop a, a set of options that work well for you with colors that you find pleasing because what I find pleasing might not be the same for you. And uh, just reading a few more comments in the live chat. Any good practices for white balance previous conversion? Sometimes I get errors in Lightroom white balancing. Definitely. So make sure that you're white balancing when you're actually uh, digitizing the film it's a manual white balance. Don't let it jump around between frame to frame. Set it on daylight, for example. If you're using a daylight light source underneath your film, in the underneath the film holder, um, set it to 5600K, for example, or just choose the daylight option in most cameras, which will work really well. That way, when you go into Lightroom, you have that headroom to change the white balance back to what's usually a much cooler light, um, white balance. You can use a, a cooler light white balance like 4000k 4500k that usually works fine i don't see a huge difference but make sure it's not overly warm for example or overly cool um, if it matches your light source that usually works pretty well and ash is asking any issues with the central film holder not that i've had i've mentioned a few little sort of quirks and stuff in my essential film holder review if you want to check that out towards the end i mentioned some things like you know, sometimes difficulty getting the, the film to come across to the other side, but there's some pretty easy tricks to that, like cutting the film on a diagonal. And uh, sometimes with the holder slipping around on the light table, I eventually uh, came up with a solution to that, which I talked about in my batch scanning video, which is just to use masking tape around the light source, meaning the, the feet stay exactly where they are and it doesn't slip around on the light table. So I've worked around any quirks with the film holder. I think it works great. I've tried the Veloy and I still just go back to the essential film holder because I find it a little bit quicker and easier, to be honest, especially when swapping between formats and loading film. Uh, it's just probably because I'm used to it and I'm much quicker at hand advancing the film rather than using the roller and uh, loading the roller and all that, I found a little bit slower. But again, I had the beta version of the Veloy, so you might have better luck. And it doesn't really matter too much as long as you have a decent film holder and the, holds the film flat, you'll get some good results. Hector, thanks so much. Great video. 
And uh, Technol Bismol, do you use negative lab pro for slide film? No, I don't. Uh, I've heard people that do it. There's not really much point, but I've heard some people will actually take the slide film, invert it, and then use negative lab pro to switch it back. And there might be some benefit to the colors, but slide film is something I still struggle with a little bit with DSLR scanning. So I'm trying to improve my workflow with that. Sorry, guys. Just gonna... Camera's still focusing. Cool. And yeah, like slide film is a little bit of a struggle with getting the dynamic range to show all the detail in the shadows and highlights. And I'm planning to do a complete guide and video on slide film uh, once I've perfected the workflow, which I still have not done. All right, so I think if that's it, we might jump off here. And uh, yeah, it, feel free to leave any comments on the video. If you have other questions, you know, if you watch this post live and I've just got one more from Vanessa Viola, bought the essential film holder after watching a video of the Veloy versus CFH, love it. Great, yeah, I think it's good value. Like, you know, it's hard to justify that extra cost if you don't scan a whole lot. And uh, Kim D asking any tips for DSLR scanning 120 film or do another vid. To be honest, doing 120 film, all the same tips that I gave in my batch scanning video apply exactly the same. The workflow should be the same. Obviously you just need the 120 holder of, of your choice, but the process is pretty much the same if you're doing uncut film especially. And I can't really think of anything too specific to 120 film that needs to be different besides the holder and holding it and covering it with the light source. And what do you use to hold your camera? I currently use a tripod, which is more prone to being bumped and wobbled around, but I do plan to get a copy stand sometime in the future. And Stephen Baum just saying thanks. Thanks for watching. Cool. All right, guys. I'm going to uh, leave it there. Uh, thanks for joining this live stream or for watching this post stream. Make sure you check out that article if you want to go back and do some of this uh, conversion yourself and you need some tips. And check out the previous video I did on batch scanning and some of those other ones linked in the article. Join the Discord server if you like. I'm sometimes popping on there answering questions in the technical advice channel. And I also added a film scanning channel to the Discord server. So there's a link to that in the description as well. Thanks again for joining and I hope you all have a good day. All right, guys.